As the cases of COVID-19 hits 343 in Nigeria, President Mohamed Buhari extends the lockdown by 14 days. Is this a wise decision? With over 20 cases of COVID-19 and almost 90% of all the poor people in Nigeria, Northern Nigeria might not be going on a lockdown anytime soon. This is Plus Politics, and I am Benny Ark. In his most recent address to Nigerians, President Mohamed Buhari has announced the extension of the lockdown by two weeks to further curb the spread of coronavirus pandemic. The lockdown is, however, only affects the three states that were previously announced, and that is Lagos, Ogun, and Abuja, the federal capital territory. Is this a wise decision? And what about other states of the country? And how could this affect the economy? Joining us live to discuss this um, is economist um, Boa Hon. Olojede, thank you very much, Bola Hall, for joining us via Skype this evening. Good evening. Nice to be here. Thank you. And how's the lockdown been for you? Uh, well, just the way it is for most Nigerians. Uh, it, it, it's, it's not good. You just have to stay at home, not, not uh, being able to get on the road and get things done. No, but, but for you, let me, actually, personally, let me ask you, what, what, has this, what has this highlighted for you as a person? Oh, uh, well, I've been learning some new skills. Um, uh, there are ways to get the, a few things done. Let's try the fact that you're sitting at home. Uh, I mean, having made some submissions were quite long. I could have two hours, three hours of um, Zoom or, or, or Skype. I, I can't so I'm looking to do We're getting things done. That's five minutes old. Okay, now let's, let's get into it this evening. Um, yesterday, President Mahmoud Bari gave a nationwide address um, on the extension of um, the lockdown order, still under the prevention and forestalling the spread of COVID-19 pandemic in Lagos, Ogun State, and the Federal Capital Territory, Abuja. Now, in that address, what stood out for you as an economist? Did he allay any fears to, for you when it comes to the, to the economy of the country? Oh, uh, well... Uh, the, the the connection is is a bit. You know, I don't know if it's on my side or not. I can hear you now. Yes. Can, did you hear me? Uh, I didn't hear the latter part of what you said. I heard it. Now, yeah. going by the president's address yesterday, the nationwide address extending the lockdown order to forestall the spread of COVID nineteen. I'm saying now, as an economist, what fears did they allay for you, given our economy currently? Uh, it's a disaster as uh, from an economic perspective. Uh, every 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 day uh, we don't work, we're losing money. money. From that, and also worsening the poverty situation of Nigeria. Every day that uh, we don't work. So, from an economic perspective, it's a major major disaster. Now, I'm asking, going back to the president's speech, were there anything that stood out for you economically? I mean, in, in terms of reforms that will be put in place during this time and even the post-COVID era, what stood out for you from that speech? From that speech, there is, um, the, the, the emphasis on things related to the economy were not, uh, were not many. Uh, it, it didn't really talk much about the economy. Um, I, th I think the, the focus was on keeping us safe and how down to help us to prevent uh, a major crisis. That, that was uh, many things in terms uh, of, of, of the economy. So you mentioned at some point that um, he's aware that, you know, not going out affects uh, how people uh, uh, end their living. There's an acknowledgement of the fact that a lot of people will not be able to earn if they don't go out. So he said something like that. But what I found uh, was uh, uh, maybe something robust in terms of provisions or, or effective uh, palliative uh, 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 rollout to mitigate all those effects of the things they mentioned. I, I didn't hear that. So maybe maybe in the days ahead, there will be some uh, more communication in that direction. Now, we've had, we've had a two weeks of lockdown, which, which expired yesterday, and now we have an extension for another two weeks. Now, many, many will say that they're taught by the president's address yesterday, the issues of um, comprehensive palliatives will have characterized that speech. 
And, and we didn't see so much of that yesterday from that speech, other than telling us, um, aside, um, other than the 2.5 million households who were being uh, food being distributed to, an additional 1 million were going to be included. Um, comprehensive palliatives. Uh, what were you expecting from that speech in regards to comprehensive palliative? If, even the extension by an additional 1 million of, of uh, those uh, cash transfer scheme, uh, it, it wasn't properly done. It, it, because the first batch, the first 2.6 uh, 2.6 million people that were rich. There were a lot of complaints about how uh, the distribution went. There are people who even believe that um, a lot of people who should have benefited from that thing did not benefit. So we, we, we don't know if the extension will now be more effective. From all indications, the first batch was not as effective as everybody expected. Uh, it didn't seem to trickle down to every part uh, as we expected. Oh, you are an economist. Um, let's bring, bring us up to speed to world happenings, and global happenings economically around the world, and particularly in our nation, Nigeria. We're, we're peculiar people. And so if you, if you can, just bring us up to speed to what the situation is right now in, in the global economy. In the global economy, um, a, a, a lot of uh, bookmakers believe that we're already in recession. And that, that is not uh, something to be debated. When you think about the fact that a lot of economics have been locked down for several weeks, whether you're looking at Europe or America, even in, in, in several parts of Asia, India is totally locked up. You know, so the world is in a global recession, uh, no doubt about that. Uh, it becomes worse for countries like us because we are already uh, a poor country and the safety nets are not that robust. The safety nets are not robust, the reserves, the things we can fall back on. Uh, most of them are not there. So because they are not there, uh, that makes it worse for us. However, what several economists are trying to do, uh, don't forget that most of them are still locked down, anyway, including UK, Italy, you know. Uh, but what most economists will do post this event is to see um, how they can spend their way out of the recession. So there has to be measures that will put disposable incomes in the pockets of individuals. There has to be measures um, that will ensure that employers do not have to get rid of too many employees, that they will be able to keep on employees because those employees need to also earn income and spend for us to be able to get out of the loop. So that is the focus of most economies uh, for now, you know, as part of the plan uh, of what they will do post-COVID. But in the COVID time, uh, what is happening is the, the palliative, how to make it easier for the uh, lowest rung of the ladder to want to stay at home. If I earn my income on daily basis and you ask me to sit at home, um, there must be something that will make it work. Otherwise, I will not be able to sit at home. I'm not going to sit at home and die of hunger while running away from COVID. So those palliatives are targeted at the lowest rung of the ladder to ensure that these people are able to preserve the lockdown. The lockdown is very important for uh, curtailing the spread of the virus. There's, there's no doubt about it. The, the lockdown is, is, is important. Uh, but at the same time, we must be able to conduct an effective palliative uh, uh, regime for example, in Lagos, we know where the poor lives in Lagos. We know where they live. And we can reach most of them. By the time we go to the Jorabadias of this world, some part of Ajekule, some part of Makoko, some part of Elijah, some part of Bariga, some part of Oru, and several other places, we know all these places, even under the bridges. So we know where the poor live. If we reach those people who are in all those places, we will have affected a chunk of the people we seek to then we can all come to all the other people that live uh, among the, uh, uh, the middle class, among the uh, mass affluent, and even the HNI. We can reach all of them. So um, for us, the structured way, you know, you have an America, for example, that says, oh, I will give you some checks. I'll send checks. If it's possible, in America, to send checks to people uh, because they have the database, they have the information to be able to do that. Don't forget also that in America, the IRS 
wants you to have filed your taxes for this year for you to qualify for the check anyway. Now, now uh, but on, yeah, is, I, I need to interject. To Can I, let me just interject here a bit if I mean, you don't mind. Yeah, let me interject. Interesting, you did, you did make reference to America having the database to carry out whatever research they want to carry out. Now, many people have questioned where we got our database for the 2.6, 2.5 million people that are currently being, um, food are being, relief materials are being distributed to. Now, because we all know that is one issue we have in this country. There's, there's no effective data system and collection. So how did they come about the 2.5 million people and then the additional 1 million people that this um, relief materials and support materials will be getting to? Well, um, according to the minister, uh, there was certain data that have been collected before now. Uh, you know, the cash transfer regime did not just start. It's, it's been around for a while um, in this administration. Maybe since 2016, 2017, uh, we've been doing a bit of this. Uh, so according to her, they had all those data. But I was surprised um, that there, there was certain information going around, for example, that Katsina State uh, received quite, uh, uh, maybe the largest part of what was distributed. But I also saw people from Daura tweeting that they did not receive, that they were, they were asking the government, where is the palliative? So the question is, if somebody in Daura, that is the hometown of the president himself, in Katsina State, is complaining of not seeing the palliative, not knowing when the palliative went around, then there's a problem with that database. That is the reality. Right. In a country of two... 100 million people getting to distribute money to 2.6 million is going to be difficult. We don't have those data. I don't believe we have those. Data. Not that they cannot well, be collected. We, we, we can use. We can use. Um, we because, can use the bank. Like I said, but no, we, we can use the, the use of the bank verification number can be used to do that effectively, isn't it? Most banks have people's database in that regards. Your bank verification number can be used to do that when it comes to cash transfers. That is why effectively I the cash you transfers can be done. Yeah, yeah. I, I said to a certain extent because at 2019, there are only, uh, le there are actually, there were less than 40 million BVN linked accounts in Nigeria as at 2019. Um, and we, if we are 200 million and there are less than 40 million BVN linked accounts, there's a huge gap there, as you can see. Out of that 40 million linked accounts, you have the Dangotes and the Otedolas of this world as part of it. You have the HNIs. The mass affluent, the middle class, they're all part of that 40 million. So when you really want to send money to the poor of the poor, or you want to soft, give them some soft landing, you might end up sending 10,000 to me, for example. I, 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 I don't need handouts, but my BVN is out there as well. So BVN can help, but it will not still be enough. We can use it to complement other structure. Other informal structure in the society. I've mentioned, for example, certain places that in Lagos that when you get to those places, you don't need anybody to tell you that the people that live in those places will need help. This is very simple. Okay. Now, uh, Malon, let, let's talk about economic reforms that are critical now that we're going through this pandemic and also the post-pandemic era. We, we have over 86 million Nigerians who live in extreme poverty, according to the World Poverty Index. And with a ravaging pandemic and the lockdown, things are likely getting worse and might get pretty worse. What economic reforms are critical now and post um, COVID-19 era as an economist? Um, I, I, I'm delighted that a few things started happening just, be, just before, uh, or, or maybe around the time, the early days of COVID in Nigeria. One of it is um, the, the, the devaluation uh, I, I don't know whether that is the right word, but it's, 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 a deep, it's a form of devaluation of the Naira. We have held this currency artificially at a rate, and we are bleeding to keep it at that rate. At some point, it was almost becoming insane to keep the currency at that rate. But I think sometimes last month, we were able to do something along that line. Another major thing that has happened in terms of reform that in this COVID season, it seems to have deregulated the PMS market. And I hope it is total deregulation this time around. That has implication. I, I particularly like the deregulation of the PMS uh, 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 market. Okay. The implication is that rather than that fixed price of 145, 
We have said uh, 125, 123.5. If today, uh, COVID ends today, and the average Nigerian had to spend about 20 naira less on every liter of PMS that is consumed, it is a stimulus. It automatically drops into everybody's pocket. Automatically. So if I'm a driver, it means that for every liter of oil I buy, I save 20 naira. It could even become lower because that is what deregulation is all about. If oil price falls further, we might even have a further lower uh, uh, fuel price, PMS price, which everybody could benefit from. Apart from that, generally, in, 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 a, in a recession, like I said earlier, you want to be able to spend your way out of it. So we're going to have to sustain certain infrastructure, certain spending on infrastructure, certain infrastructure, which will involve employment. Anything that has to do with construction employs a lot of people. When you employ them, you put money in their pockets, they are able to spend. Consumption, essentially, is very important to getting out of the session. You're going to have to make some soft landing for employers, too. When you make some allowances for them, it means they're able to keep more staff on their employment. They have to pay them. Those people are able to consume. It is good for the economy. You will go to the medium and the small-scale uh, uh, um, uh, uh, enterprises. Already, interestingly, under the Finance Act, which was signed into law this year, the Finance Act already says people with 25 billion or less revenue do not have to pay taxes. That is good enough. Then the medium enterprises, their own taxes were lowered from 10 to 20 percent. It's, it's also an incentive. So we need to look at all of these things together and ensure that they don't just remain on the pages of newspapers, that they get executed. For example, the infrastructure. The special infrastructure of the federal government was meant to be, I think, uh, in about 20 states. As part of the current package, they're extending that to the old federation, so 36 states and the federal capital territory, Abuja. Now, if you have projects that are going on, federal government is spending. So when we talk about consumption, it's not just that the individuals are spending. It's also important that government itself continue to spend. So as government spend on those special infrastructure, those special infrastructure are meant to go all the way to the local government and be able to employ 1,000 people from each local government. Okay. So from a plan perspective, that is fantastic. We now have to be able to see it to execution. That, that is a very, very important one, so that they are not just uh, speechy and plans, but they actually get to the people who are meant to benefit from it. All right. Now, st still on, on economic reforms, prior to the emergence of COVID-19, I mean, th there, was, there was a huge dichotomy between our fiscal and monetary policy. And so now, now we're dealing with a, with, with a pandemic where a whole lot of economic activities seem to be at a halt. Now, do you think this in any way is still, is still going to increase that gap between the dichotomy between our fiscal and monetary policy and how this can be um, tackled and addressed now? Like I said, I, th I think we're already addressing some of them. Those okay. little reforms, those exchange rate thing that we see, those uh, tax reforms that we see are all part of uh, trying to, to bridge the gap between those two things. Yes, okay. The COVID situation um, is something that nobody has seen. There is no leader in the world today that has seen anything like this. No. Even if someone has been around in 1918, I can assure you that the measures that were adopted in 1918 will not fit into 2020. So it is fresh. There will be a lot of new thinking that will come on the plate that we have to look at and continue to do it. Let me give you uh, an example. For example. Uh, let me give you an example. Nobody really knows when this COVID matter is going to be over. If you don't know when something is going to be over, it means that even your goalposts will continue to shift. Will continue to shift. So our plans at this time must be very robust. There's one thing I am happy that we were able to do last, was it last year or early this year that we put in place the Economic Advisory uh, uh, Committee. It's a very, very important step. And the reason is because committees like that will help us to bridge the gap that you spoke about. These gentlemen are economists. They've been there. They've done that. 
they have a thorough understanding of the local economy and they know what is going on internationally. If they need to call a friend, they know who exactly to speak across the world. So if we take, because what, what, one thing we want to allow in a time like this is to start having a cacophony of voices. Uh, CBN goes to the left, Federal Ministry of Finance goes to the right, everybody just saying all sort of things. But if we have a channel, a channel of wise men who can distill all these things from the various quarters and advise the president on the way to go, we will be able to have a less bumpy ride on this talk. Right. And for me, that Economy Advisory Committee is an important thing. All right, Bolan Lojade, you stay with us. Thank you for your contributions in this segment. You stay with us in the next segment. And thank you for staying with us. We'll take a short break now. And when we return, the reason why Northern Nigeria might not experience a lockdown is up next for discussion. We'll be right back. <laughs>